Good morning. My name is Daryl Ann, and it's my privilege to bring the Bible reading to you this morning. John chapter 4, verses 27 to 42. Just then, his disciples returned and were surprised to find him talking with a woman. But no one asked, what do you want? Or why are you talking with her? Then, leaving her water jar, the woman went back to the town and said to the people, come, see a man who told me everything I ever did. Could this be the Messiah? They came out of the town and made their way toward him. Meanwhile, his disciples urged him, Rabbi, eat something. But he said to them, I have food to eat that you know nothing about. Then his disciples said to each other, could someone else have brought him food? My food, said Jesus, is to do the will of him who sent me and to finish his work. Don't you have a saying, it's still four months until harvest? I tell you, open your eyes and look at the fields. They are ripe for harvest. Even now, the one who reaps draws a wage and harvests a crop for eternal life so that the sower and reaper may be glad together. Thus the saying, one sows and another reaps, is true. I sent you to reap what you have not worked for. Others have done the hard work, and you have reaped the benefits of their labor. Many of the Samaritans from that town believed in him because of the woman's testimony. He told me everything I ever did. So when the Samaritans came to him, they urged him to stay with him, and he stayed two days. And because of his words, many more became believers. They said to the woman, we no longer believe just because of what you said. Now we have heard for ourselves, and we know that this man really is the savior of the world. Thanks, Sarah You are, I'm sure many of you would know of Charles Spurgeon, uh, who was a Baptist pastor in London uh, at the Metropolitan Tabernacle uh, in the late 1800s. And uh, he was called to be the pastor there at that church uh, when he was, well, he was actually called, I think, when he was 19, and he began when he was 20. And he was there for 38 years uh, until he, he passed away. And uh, by that point, uh, it was a church that had grown to have more than 5,000 members. And he was at a gathering of, of Scottish pastors uh, at one point, and someone asked him, how he got his congregation. And uh, his response was to say, well, I, I never got it at all. I didn't think it was my business to do so, but only to preach the gospel. My congregation got my congregation. You know, as, as great a preacher as he was, he never saw himself as being some kind of lone ranger who was there to be the one who would reach London for Christ by himself. It, the way that the church grew was as the people in that church were faithfully following Christ and proclaiming the message of the gospel to those around them. And one of the things that they did is that they... Well, here's a picture of um, what the inside of the Metropolitan Tabernacle looked like. I think that's um, it's since uh, it was well destroyed a couple of times, including in World War II and they re rebuilt it. Uh, but it would, uh, you, you see the little speck in the middle is uh, the pulpit uh, with Charles Spurgeon. Uh, but one of the things that they did was to uh, have these testimony books where the elders would record the stories of people as they put their faith in Jesus. And one of the stories was about Ellen May, who was a servant girl who, I, you know, I don't know if she worked at Downsend Abbey, that, but that's the kind of place that I picture this, this happening. And uh, one of the women from the church uh, came to work at the same place as another servant in that household. And the record that was made said this, it appears that our sister was not long there without trying to do something for the glory of Christ and the good of souls for she was made the instrument in awakening this young girl to a sense of her lost estate. Yeah. 
What a wonderful privilege it is to be instruments in the hands of Christ to save, to be you know, proclaiming the gospel you know, to people so that they may be saved. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you that this morning we can gather together here as, as people who know that you have called us to belong to you. And we pray that we would know that you call us to be your instruments, to be your hands and your feet, to be at work in this world. We pray, Lord, that we would be people who have a passion for declaring the glory of Christ because we are people who have seen him for who he is and what he has done for us on the cross. That we see his glory. And because of that, we have a passion to declare him to a world that is lost without him, a world that needs him. We pray, Lord, that we would be encouraged again as we see this story this morning. As in the name of Christ that we pray. Amen. So just to uh, recap, as we've been making our way through the Gospel of John, uh, we've seen Jesus trying to help people to see things differently and to see him for who he is, to see the, the world the way that he does. And so he says, he does things like he goes into the temple courts and he, he's clearing them out and he says, destroy this temple and in three days I will raise it up. And he meets Nicodemus on the rooftop in, in Jerusalem. And he says, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. And then last week we, we looked at the Samaritan woman at the well and how Jesus meets her. And he says, if you knew the gift of God and who it is who says to you, give me a drink, then you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. And it's easy for people to see a physical temple that's made of stone and just to understand what it means to be physically born or to get water from a well. Yeah, but people don't get a man who came to be the new dwelling place of God, the way that we can come to be with him. Or what it means for us to be born again from above, or to have a living water that is all satisfying and wells up to eternal life. And Jesus wants us to see him for who he is and help those around us to come and see him. And we are all called to be part of this work together. Uh, a work that is for each and every one of us, and no matter what we might think of ourselves. And, and we see a beautiful example of this here in this, this story as we're continuing uh, to look at uh, the story here with the, the Samaritan woman. You know, someone who was, uh, in many ways, a very unlikely evangelist. And so in verse 27, as we're, we, we continue with this story, Jesus has been talking with her, with her and then, then the disciples return and they're surprised to, to find him talking with, with a woman. But no one asked, you know, what do you want or why are you, you talking with her? And then leaving her water jar, the woman went back to the town and said to the people, you know, the people that she'd previously avoided, you know, people she was ashamed to be with, I mean, we see her excitement here. She says, come see a man who told me everything I ever did. Could this be the Messiah? And they, they come out of the town and they make their way towards him. And he was a woman who had met Christ and excited uh, to be able to go and tell people about him. And could this be the Messiah? And then people are curious about what's caused this change in this woman and they, they come out uh, to, to see you know, we are all called to be like this Samaritan woman. But a question might be, well, how good are we at actually doing this? How good are we at actually sharing our faith and proclaiming the faith that we have? And uh, you might remember uh, filling out those forms for the National Church Life Survey uh, some time ago. Uh, it was done in 2021 and then the results were released last year. And uh, as part of this, um, the Australian Baptists said, you know, we need to have a think about how good we are at actually sharing our faith. 
Uh, so it included this um, well, little comic which says, look, all I said was, oh Lord, show us, now, show us how to serve you better. And this great mirror plonks into the ground, uh, which took me a little while to figure out. But eventually I think, I think the idea is that we need to take a, a good look at ourselves in the mirror. Yeah? Are we actually sharing our faith with those around us? How are we going with that? Yeah, so uh, it was something that was specially done by Australian Baptists to, to, to study this particular question. And what we found, yeah, as, as you might expect, you know, it is something that is very hard you know, to be willing to, you know, to feel like we are actually equipped to, to share our faith and to be willing to do this. You know, not many people are, are completely at ease or feel very well equipped uh, to do so. Only about 20% of people feel that way. And the rest of us might feel like we're, you know, we've, we've I think, crashed on the moon here and wishing, now we've got this great opportunity, a, a captive audience, and wishing that we'd done that workshop on how to share our faith. And we don't feel necessarily like we're very well equipped to be able to do that. Most of us have fairly mixed feelings about this. So we might wonder, well, well how many people do actually go out and share their faith uh, with someone who... You know, they might have met through some kind of secular context. They might have met them at the, in, a, in the workplace or at a, a sporting club or a, a neighbour who, who lives close to them. How often do people actually go about sharing their faith? And uh, this is a little bit tricky to, to see, but those three columns that are on the left, yes, uh, are people who share their faith with someone at least monthly, or even more than that. And it, it works out to be about 29% of people. Whereas most of us fall into that big blue column uh, of people who will do it occasionally, you know, whatever that might mean. And then some people on, on the, the far side would say that they have never shared their faith with anyone. And one of the interesting findings was that older people feel more comfortable sharing their faith, but it's younger people who actually tend to do it more. Uh, so for those who are young adults under the age of 30, you know, if we remember that the average overall for those who would share their faith at least monthly was about 30%, you know, for the, the young adults, they would share it, if you know, 40% of them would fall into that category, Whereas for those who are older, 70 and above, it falls to 20% share their, their faith monthly. And I suspect that has a lot to do with the kind of opportunities that young people have, being out and about and meeting lots of people and, and forming those relationships. Uh, but it is something which I thought was quite encouraging to see that, that young people are quite willing and actually out sharing their faith uh, with people or at least saying that they do, and we trust that they're, they're answering the, the survey truthfully. You know, we are all called to be like this Samaritan woman. You know, we may not feel like we're terribly well-equipped, and you know, we don't have a great theology. You know, this, this woman you barely knew anything. She's just begun to, to learn about who Jesus is, and she's excited to go and share whatever it is that she had begun to, to learn. You know, I think that the more and more that we see Jesus for who he is, the more and more we will have a passion and excitement for going and telling people about him. You know, if we are Swans supporters, we'll be shouting from the rooftops about the game last night and how well they did. Just waiting for Justin to get back and, and tell me all about it. You know, if, we, if we see something that we, we love and we, we, we enjoy, then we want to tell people about it. That's what it's about that's what it's like uh, for us and Jesus. But if we want to see him, if we want to know him, the key to this is to be in the word of God and knowing that that is how we see Jesus for who he is. And that is what gives us the sustaining power that we need uh, to be on this, uh, about this work of discipleship. And we see this as the story continues. 
So in verse 31, uh, meanwhile, his disciples urged Jesus. They said, Rabbi, eat something. But he said to them, I have food to eat that you know nothing about. It's almost like a Jedi thing. I don't know. I have food to eat that you know nothing about. And then his disciples say to each other, what, did someone else get him food? Or like, why did we just go all the way into town to, to get the food for him? Uh, someone else, could someone else have brought him food? They're, they're thinking physically. You know, they're, they're, you know we, all this talk of food, we're probably salivating over the, the cup of soup for, for lunch. You know, I'm still remembering the, the, the chicken that Portia made for us for the evening service last week. And then I had several containers of leftovers during the week. It was magnificent. But as good as it is, that's not the kind of food that we need. The food we need is the Word of God. As Jesus says here, my food is to do the will of him who sent me and to finish his work. And this is what keeps him going. And this is what he needs to be on about uh, this work. It's to know that he is doing what the Father wants him to do. Yeah, that's what fills him up and strengthens him and sustains him and satisfies him. Yeah, it's, and I think as he's saying that, he, he's probably thinking of what was said back in Deuteronomy 8, that when the people, after they came out of the, the Exodus, they're, they're wandering the wilderness, and God gives them the, the manna. And uh, in Deuteronomy 8, Moses says, He humbled you, causing you to hunger and then feeding you with manna, to teach you that man does not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of the Lord. And the disciples ask Jesus what, what food he has. And he says, I have been eating. My food is to do the will of my Father, to be about his work. So I've been, been talking with this Samaritan woman, you know, telling her about the, the, her need of salvation. And brothers, I can tell you, I am full. He's nourished not from eating, but from showing love to this woman. The more that we share Jesus, the more we will savor him. Something that came out of the NCLS was that for those the, the young adults who were most likely to, to share, uh, who, who, who did share their faith, they were most likely to do that. It's reinforcing some point I was making, I'm sure. <laughs> the, they were most likely to share their faith when they were in an environment where it was, it was fairly relaxed, and especially if they'd seen someone else do it, but also if they were at a time when they felt close to God. But... I think that is actually it is by them sharing their faith that is part of what makes them feel close to God. And when we give ourselves to his work, we get more of him. And we give and we get. And not financially, not, not physically, like the prosperity gospel movement might say, but spiritually. And when we serve in mission for God... It's a way of nourishing our soul on him. I wonder what it would mean for us as a church to say that our food is to do the will of him who sent us and to do his work. It's, and I think that's, you know, we need to, to know that we begin by saying that the power is in the gospel. You know, the power to save people, the power of God to bring people to faith is the message of the gospel about who Christ is and what he's done for us. It's very easy to build a church. And you know, we can try, we just focus on putting on a good show and entertaining people, have some false promises about you know, if you just come and you give lots of money to the church, then you know, you'll be blessed and you'll be healthy and, and wealthy and victorious in whatever it is you might try to do. But if we want to build a church that is truly for the glory of Christ, we need to build it on the foundation of the truth, with Christ as the cornerstone, and feast on the one who alone is truly the sustaining power of God, and the power of the gospel, of who Christ is. 
And so I think our focus needs to be on how can we find opportunities to be sharing that message of the gospel with those around us? You know, how can we have conversations with people where we share them about the difference that Christ has made in our life? Can we set aside time to be parts of, of small groups where we can gather together and study the Word of God and discipling people to faith and in the faith? Can we go and uh, help lead with uh, the, the kids' programs and the, the youth programs? Can we be on the lookout for those who are, are, are new, who have come uh, to church, to welcome them and to, to talk with them after the, the service? And to ask them about whether they have a hope in Christ, whether they know him. It's something that Spurgeon said, uh, is that uh, I, I always ask my own congregation to preach Christ in the pews and get hold of the people who come there and tell them about Christ. And I know people are a little starched up about the matter sometimes, a little Mahogany comes between them and their fellows. But in the church, there should be cordiality. Uh, the feeling that a person may venture to speak to his neighbor, to say at least, how did you enjoy the sermon? And to start the conversation and detain them for a little while. And for many of the, the testimonies that they recorded, you know, that this is where it begins with someone in the church being willing to go and have a, a conversation with them. And so for the story of William Cartwright, it said this. He said, it says, He came to hear our pastor last April and continued to do so several times without any profit. But on one occasion, our brother Spanswick sought an opportunity of asking him whether he had ever thought of his soul's salvation. He acknowledged that he had not and was urged to seek the Lord. And he did so, and he soon discovered what a guilty sinner he was and that God would be just in condemning him, but his only plea was the blood of Jesus. And he was a man who had listened to many sermons from Spurgeon himself, and yet what made the difference was someone who was willing to go up and talk with him about where he stood in terms of his faith. It is up to each one of us to be willing to have conversations like that. And we may feel like we don't have all the answers to the kind of questions that they might ask. And that's, that's fine, because we don't need to. You know, evangelism is not supposed to be you know, us out as a lone ranger. It's, evangelism is a, a team game. Uh, we do this together. And you know, we have different roles in this, working as one body of Christ. Yeah. And God designed it to be this way. You know, we're not off ourselves trying to, to preach the gospel. We do it as part of the body of Christ because he wants us to have this joy of partnering together in this work. There we go. So as, as the passage continues, verse 35, don't you, Jesus is saying, uh, he says, don't you have a saying it's still four months until harvest. You know, the way that the, the natural world works is you, you sow uh, the seed and then you wait for it to, to grow and then eventually you're able to reap the harvest. And it might take four months for this to happen. Yeah. But I tell you, open your eyes and look at the fields. They are ripe for harvest. And there was a promise back in Amos that said that when the Messiah came, it would be a time when it would be so amazing that the sowers and the reapers would be all working together at the same time. And verse 36, Even now, the one who reaps draws a wage and harvests a crop for eternal life, so that the sower and the reaper may be glad together. You know, when we go out on this work of disciple-making, on this work of mission, you know, we, we don't need to think in terms of the, the kind of... Uh, way that the, the world works and the kind of natural kind of fixed laws that we might expect to happen. We, we can expect God to do the unexpected. And so we should, for instance, we should not assume that we have to wait in order to see the harvest. 
Yeah, it's great this morning that we're now officially launching uh, the BDC, Building a Discipleship Culture. But that doesn't mean that we don't, that we just stop the work of discipleship. And we need to lift up our eyes and be on the lookout. You know, Jesus, here in this story, has been sowing the seed of the word with this woman. And now she's gone to, to sow the seed in the, some more in the town. And now the, the disciples turn up and they're wondering about what Jesus is going to have for lunch. <coughs> but they, they need, those disciples need to lift their eyes and see uh, what God is doing. That the town that they just went to for food is a town that is white for harvest. You know, we should not say that we need to wait four months or 12 months or two years. We can sow the seed of the gospel now and we can do it expecting that God will be at work. You know, trust that he will use his word as it goes out from us. And it might be that in the past we've tried to do this, we've shared the word of the gospel with people and we haven't you know, seen anyone come to faith or that it takes time for them to do that. And that may well be the case. But we don't need to be trapped into thinking that, that it's, it's always going to be like that just because it's been like that in the past. And we can be open to seeing what God is doing and what he's doing here now, here in this church, what he's doing here now in this town. And we can look and we can see a town that is white, ready for harvest. There are people who are waiting for us to go and tell them the word of truth. You know, one of the things that was, was found in the NCLS, uh, it, was, it looked at how often people would invite others to come to church. And it is something which, over the years, as they've been doing this study, you know, how often have you, like, have you actually invited someone to church in the last 12 months? And the, the proportion of people who would say yes has been declining. So it's gone from 41% all the way down now to 27% in this last study. And people are inviting others to church less and less often. And the statistics for Hughes Baptist, for us, is uh, this decline is actually even more severe. You know, it used to be that we were, well, in, in that first study, we were better than the average. You know, we're punching above our weight. Uh, we were at 50% compared to 41 Whereas in this last study, we were actually below the average. Yeah. We need to be willing to tell people about Christ and invite them to come and be part of our gathering here where we can focus on him. And we might wonder if we ask them, will they come? Will they be willing to come? And one of the extraordinary things which came out of this study was that, well, the way it's... it's they usually present it, is that if you were to ask, if, if they ask people generally, out, out in the, the community, if you were asked and like invited to come to church by someone who was a close friend or part of your family, would you come? And three in ten people said yes. If they were asked, they would come. And it's actually better than that because a quarter of the people who were asked said that they actually didn't have any close friends or family who were Christian. So of those who do, 42% of them said yes, they would be willing to come, especially if they felt like it was something that was important to the person who was asking them. Now, if we go and ask, or we pray that we do have close friends and family who don't yet know Christ, and if we were to go and ask them, there is a really good chance they might actually say yes. They're just waiting for us to go, waiting for us to ask them. The other, you know, we don't need to assume that we have to wait and we can be doing this now. But we also don't, we shouldn't assume that the person who sows will be the same person as the one who reaps. So in verse 37, and thus the saying, one sows and another reaps is true. Jesus says, I sent you to reap what you have not worked for. 
Others have done the hard work. And John the Baptist has already been in, here in this region. Uh, and uh, now Jesus has been talking with this, this woman and she goes into the town. And they've already been doing the hard work of sowing the seed. And now Jesus says to his disciples, and you have reaped the benefits of their labor. Now you see this crowd of people coming out from the town, wanting to know about whether this is the Messiah. And you can now reap the benefits of what has come before. <coughs> yeah, evangelism is a team game, and we have different roles to play in this. Uh, one of the other stories from the testimony books was about Charles Sandel. One of his co-workers invited him to, to go to the church and to hear Spurgeon, and he went for about 12 months. And this is what the book said. It says... He continued to attend without any apparent benefit, though he was frequently made to weep under the sermon. But during the absence of Mr. Spurgeon on the continent, he heard Mr. Radcliffe, who was a guest preacher, uh, who was made the means of convincing him of sin. And after the service, he had some conversations with one of the elders, and he was enabled to trust his soul on Jesus. Now, he sat on the Spurgeon for a year, but it was some random guest preacher who comes and, the, and an elder talking with him that made the difference. And this man came and put his faith in Christ. Now, we work together in sharing the gospel and we have different roles in this. And some of us will be people who will sow the seed into a, of the word into a person's life. And others will have the immense privilege of being there at the time when they come to faith. But there is the encouragement for both of us. You know, for those who sow, the encouragement is to press on. We may not always see that the fruits of our labor, but we can lift our eyes to the future and trust that God will be at work. And if we are the ones who are there able to reap, that we recognize that it's not all about us. There are many who have faithfully spoken into life of this person before they have come and now put their faith in Christ. You know, God's design is that we may be glad together. You know, mission is meant to be a joyful work, you know, but it's not a, an easy work. It's not a safe work. You know, there will be long seasons of sowing, you know, an immense uh, time when you know, we will have immense battles with discouragement. And we need to keep on believing that God will be at work and that the investment that we make into the lives of the people around us in sowing this seed is worth whatever sacrifice it might take. And then there will be seasons of harvesting. And in those times, we may battle with all kinds of opposition. We might have difficulties in our families, we might have sickness, we might have conflict, we might have persecution. Yeah, it will be hard, but there is always hope because we know that God is the one who is at work gathering his people. And that is what we see here in this story. In verse 39, many of the Samaritans from that town believed in him because of the woman's testimony. He did everything. He told me everything I ever did. And so when the Samaritans came to him, they urged him to stay with them. And he stayed two days. And because of his words, many more became believers. And they said to the woman, we no longer believe just because of what you said. Now we have heard for ourselves and we know that this man really is the savior of the world. And no one is beyond the grace of God. If God has a people in a place like Samaria, he has a people in a place like Canberra. And he calls for us to go and sow and to reap a harvest for him. Let's pray. <coughs> Heavenly Father, we pray that we would know that our food is to do the will of the one who called us and sent us. We pray that we would feed on the all-satisfying word of God and the one who is the word. 
that he would give us our strength, that he would sustain us, that he would be our all-satisfying saviour. We pray, Lord, that we would be part of this great work of gathering your people, that we would sow the seed of the gospel, ready to, to reap a harvest that will be for the glory of Christ and for the good of souls. And it's in the name of Christ that we pray. Amen.